strange how you, you can often imagine things which turn out to have been the case. I, I don't want to get all Californian on you, but sometimes it does feel rather like being a medium, that, 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 that it comes through you. And I remember watching Leonard Cohen do a speech in Spain when he was accepting the um, Prince of Asturias Prize. Him saying, I don't feel I should take any credit for what came through me and not from me. And I, I often feel like, like that myself, as if um, I am not really the writer. I, I, I feel sometimes like an imposter. Does that make sense? That, that does. And you mentioned earlier what you feel is your masterpiece, and that's Birds Without Wings. And this is set during the Ottoman Empire and the transformation into the modern Turkish state. You've obviously done some extensive research for the book. How do you go about doing such research? And how much of it do you actually use? Uh, research comes in many forms. Um, all the, what all the forms have in common is that they're really interesting and really good fun. Oh, okay. oh, I'm so sorry. There is a car that's blocking the entrance. FZ9281. FZ9281. Okay. Not, not me, Gov. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, all, 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 the, all the ways of doing research are fun. I mean, obviously a certain amount of it is just sitting around reading. But a lot more fun than that is going out to interview people. I've interviewed a lot of interesting people um, all over the world as time has gone by. I mean, including once, you know, when um, Shivanti came with me on a research trip here in Sri Lanka once, and uh, um, I interviewed somebody called Professor Kingsley da Silva, who was an expert, oh, I think it was in Norelia, wasn't it? Or was it Candy? Candy. It was Candy. Yeah. He was an expert on the sort of the conventions and relations between the, um, between the white planters or the white people here and, and, the, and the Sri Lankans. And he, he told me a lot of very interesting things which ended up in uh, one of my novels, um, So Much Life Left Over. Um, so yes, you interview people and of course that means traveling. I'm, I'm very fond of traveling. I'm, I'm one of these people who travels in the expectation of it being absolutely transformative, you like, for example, meeting the ideal woman. You know, it never happens, but um, <laughs> but I, I always travel hopefully, and I travel with great curiosity. And I think one of the best research trips I had was to um, what the Turks call Chanakale and the British call Gallipoli, where, um, where the, the British and the French invaded in 1915 in the hope of getting troops to Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. And of course, we got blocked by the Ottoman Empire, by the Ottoman soldiers. And it was a terrible battle that lasted many, many months. And in the end, the British and the French had to withdraw. My grandfather was there, so I have a personal connection with it. Um, I decided that, okay, everybody, you know, in the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, we know our own side of what happened, but we don't have the Turkish story. So I decided to write about that a campaign from the Turkish side. I, had, I went to collect Turkish stories, you know, not the British ones. And it was such an interesting thing. And it was also, it was sort of, it was also huge fun and sad. I walked around the battlefields, you know, the bones are still coming to the surface. You find bones everywhere. You find the seabed, if you go snorkeling, is covered with bits of, with shrapnel, you know, round lead balls. Um, you find bullet cases. You find bits of broken china where the British soldiers used to have their cups of tea. Um, and, and it's, what's particularly poignant about it is that it's so peaceful now that all you hear is bird song, which, of course, it must be why Sebastian Folks got the idea for writing birdsong. He must have been to battlefields which are now completely quiet except for the birds. Um, but I mentioned it was fun because I, st I stayed in a little hostel in a place called Ejiabat and there was only one restaurant and it was, the cook was a man called Farouk 
He was a big fat man. And he spoke perfect French with a Provençal accent, even though he'd never been to France. And he was so pleased to see me because he thought I was French. I introduced myself as Louis. And I said, no, but I do speak French. And he was still pretty pleased. And he said, he asked me what I wanted to know. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll put the word about and I'll tell people to come in in the evenings when you're here and you can talk while you're eating. So I, I would go in every evening and he'd say, ah, oh, bonsoir, Monsieur Louis. Je vous vous je vous prépare quelque chose. And he'd, he'd give me a huge pile of food, you know, a farouk sized pile of food. And p people would come in and show me old letters and photographs or come in and tell me stories. Um, and every evening we lost the corkscrew and had to go and find another one. So that, that's an example of what fun it can be. And of course you find out things that you never would have found out just by sitting at home reading, you know, uh, for example, when I went into the interior of Turkey in Anatolia, I discovered that if there's an empty bottle on the roof of a house, it means there's a girl of marriageable age living there. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's almost a way of doing anthropology. Okay. And, and to, sorry, to finish, to finish you, you hardly use any of the research um, because you don't want to write a textbook. I mean, I'm, I don't want to write an, an, an academic anthropology book after all. I'm, I'm a storyteller. So I miss out most of what I find, um, but I, it becomes what I call invisible background. It, 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 you, it gives you the confidence to actually do the work. Yeah? In, in London, a couple of weeks ago, I attended the Coco Chanel exhibition at the v &A, the Victoria and Albert Museum, of the famous French designer. One of the rooms contained her signature perfume, Chanel No. 5, all the iconic objects were there, but what was ob absent was the smell of this perfume. And this left me feeling empty and rather disappointed. However, reading your books, Louis, particularly Birds Without Wings, what comes off the page immediately are smells of cologne, natural essences of oil, of nature and flower the sweet smells emanating from the smoking water pipes, and fighting against this, the putrid smell of death, of mud and wartime stench in the trenches. Louis, can you tell us about how you go about creating a sensory palette? Oh, my mother used to wear Chanel number no. five. Did she? Yes, yes, it reminds me of her. Um, I think that we live in a very visual culture. We, we privilege the eyes and, and, and the ears. And it's because I think we got so accustomed to watching so much television and cinema and Netflix and so on that we, we tend to forget that we have three other senses. And th this, this came to me as a sort of revelation, I think, when I was writing Captain Corelli's Mandolin. I thought, hang on, everything's got a smell. Everything's got a feel to it, you know? And everything has a taste. Not that I would recommend tasting everything you come across, unless you're a toddler. Um, so I've always been um, conscientious about including all five senses and not just two. Um, I think that's probably all I can say about that one. Um, it, 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 it's the same kind of revelation that I got when I was thinking, uh, I was hearing people complain, oh, that, you know, women are underrepresented in, in male fiction. I was, I, was, I was thinking, who's represented and who isn't? And it, it suddenly occurred to me that um, the, the people or the, the characters who get the least attention in our fiction are old people and children and animals. So there's three things. And so when I write, I'm always conscientious to include old people, children, and animals because they're so important in our lives. You know, it's foolish to miss out such a rich resource. I feel that about the senses as well.
Okay, thank you.